Hi, Ollie. Hi. This is exciting. <laughs> I feel like I've stepped into your world. I've listened to this so many times and now I'm in it. You're in it. You are in the happy place zone. I'm I'm very, very pleased, yet perhaps a little surprised that you wanted to do it because I know how private you can be. So what are the levels of discomfort right now? You know what? I always find it, I, obviously, like you, I interview lots of people. Um, and always when you're sort of sitting on the other side of the sofa, as it would be in my world, or here on the other side of the microphone with you, it feels scary always, because I think there's a sort of safety net and a barrier, isn't it? Being the one that asks the questions, because you haven't got to answer anything or say anything. So, yeah, nervous, definitely. Well, look, it's a very safe and loving space, as you know, as you've yeah. listened to it. So we're just going to I've got lots of things that I want to talk to you about. And let's start with your your new book that you've got out, Reflections. And you say in this book that this is the most personal project to date. And it, and it feels like it reading it. So what was that turning point for you where you thought, you know what, I'm I'm ready to to take a, a layer off to show a little mm. bit more of myself? What, what was that moment? Oh, it's been a long time coming. Like, there's no doubt about that. I think I definitely, I definitely always felt safer and more guarded by saying nothing and definitely keeping those layers very firmly zipped up and shut away. Um, and I think for me, there was a bit of a, I don't know, I think where where I am in my age, where I am in my life, where I am with my kids was definitely one one reason. I feel like I'm getting more space and time back for me to kind of start looking at myself and who I am in this world and what my purpose is and how I feel about things. And a lot of that, when you get to that, when you like up until now, I think you're so busy with so many other things, you sort of start to lose a little pieces of who you are because so many little pieces are being spread into other areas. Um, and I also think that I started to have the time and the space to look into different ways of coming back to myself a bit. And I think that the moment, and anybody who's listening to this that has kind of done any work on themselves, whether that be anything alternative or anything professional, the moment you start down that road, it's like, it's like it all starts opening up very, very quickly. And things that you didn't feel comfortable with talking about, you almost feel like it's your your duty, but not even your duty, it's your right to be able to speak about these things and to open up about these things and to want to share these things and to share them without feeling scared of the reaction, I think. And I think it's because you're actually peeling off layers that have been placed there by other people, possibly, by other people's opinions, possibly. And so once you peel all that back, you're sort of left with this very raw sense of self, this real kind of feeling of who you are. Um, and it's certainly not that scary anymore and it doesn't really matter what people think and what people say so it doesn't matter if you pull a layer off or not because it's it's just all you're going to find is yourself there yeah and I you know you've had more pressure than most because when you are in the public eye and to the level that you are you know that outside noise is huge so that that is a scary thing because you know whatever any of us say in a space that is public things can be taken out of context or they can yeah. be misconstrued or misunderstood where, without the explanation. That's the lovely thing about a book is that mm. you just, you know, you go into you get extreme the detail it. and it, it can't be taken out of context. But, you know, I, I get it. It took me, well, I don't think I was even thinking about talking about my real life back in the day. I mean, over the last sort of, I don't know, five, six years, obviously I've been explicitly honest about a lot of things. Yeah. And now I'm in a real comfort zone of doing it but before that I didn't even give it a thought but it but it is a lovely feeling and at the start of the book you you kind of open it up by saying you had this moment where you asked yourself the question what's next and I and I wonder what and you sort of invite the readers to do the same you know have you had that pivotal moment of what next and I, I wonder what that feeling was what was behind that was that just an inner itch for a new chapter it wasn't a search for something new. It was a search for something lost, I think. I think I asked myself, what's next? And kind of went, God, I, I actually don't know the answer. And then it was more like, well, why don't I know the answer? And it was because, like, life is very, very paved out for you, I think, to a certain extent. I mean, obviously, we all live different lives. But 
you know, you go to school, you go, you might go to college, you might go to university, you might get your first job, you might meet your partner, you might fall in love, you might get married, you might have children, they might go to school. And then, and then what? <laughs> and then suddenly this kind of mapped out map that's there, this kind of guide to life sort of spits you out the other end and you sort of go, oh God, I sort of ticked everything off. And, and it was lovely. And I'm not sitting here saying that I have any regrets over that because it's, I've done the most wonderful things. I have the most wonderful family and I count myself as very lucky. But it is weird to come out the other side of that and go, oh my God, the list stopped. Now it's down to me. And I think that that was, that was where it was. It was kind of this, right, God, this is down to me. So what, what is next? And it's the first time I've sort of thought to myself, oh, I can actually choose. And I know you can always choose, but there is a level of expectation what comes next. And we get a bit, I don't know whether it's laziness or whether it's just we're programmed to do all those things and they're lovely things. So why wouldn't you? But there is a decision now. There is a kind of this next chapter is I feel like I've got a handle on it more and I'm more in control of what it what it could look like. And do you think you found that professionally as well? Because, you know, you're top of your game. Like what what do you do next? Was that sort of running parallel with the lifestyle stuff that, you know, you'd got married, you'd had kids and you own a house alongside that you've got, oh my God, I've, I, I'm climbing the ascent, but where is where it? Did it go? You know, am I dead ended? Have I reached the top? Yeah. I think that's when you just have to think, uh, well, actually, I think what happens there is you start to do things purely out of passion and a love for something, you know, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career and I love my job. I love working on this morning. I feel very lucky to be in it, but Sometimes you go, right, where, where do my passions lie now? And they, they all tie in really to, to what the book is talking about and my next move. And, you know, Wild Moon for me was a, um, was, is the website that, that I've launched. And it's, for me, that is a space. And it's like, I, I used to be really creative when I was at school. I used to do so much, you know, I loved, I loved art, I loved drama, I loved all these things. And you just stop, you become an adult and you completely stop. So there is part of me that I just was like, God, I need to reconnect with that person who I was. So creating Wild Moon and creating this space of things that I love and that I'm inspired by and I hope that other people will be inspired by too. Like, it just feels good. So I think that's the next move is just keeping all these things bubbling that I'm already doing. But anything else that I add to that pile, it can only be because I feel a real passion and a drive to do it. I think um, as much as I don't like this word, I think as we grow older, we lose a sense of playfulness. Perhaps that comes back maybe towards the, the last part of your life, but we lose a sense of playfulness because we are somewhat socially conditioned to tick things off of a list and, and move through what is structurally in place. Not for, not for everybody and it's not everyone's cup of tea, but yeah. many people will follow that route. And it's so interesting because I underlined something in this book that I'm reading today, um, I'm reading a book called The Artist's Way, which I should have read about a thousand years ago. And it's right. on my list and it's a, a beautiful book. And I got, I had a copy at home, but I got re-gifted it. And I was like, I, I cannot ignore this book any longer. So every day I just read a few pages alongside whatever I'm reading at night. And this really plays into what we're talking about. And I kind of thought it would, hence why I've underlined it. And it says... Okay. Survival lies in sanity and sanity lies in paying attention. And I think that's what we stop doing. As kids, we're looking at worms and we're, and we're studying flowers or, you know, we become really obsessed with the little tiny things in mm. life. And when we grow up, all of that is sort of oh, pointless. I'm not looking well, we pay that. attention, but we pay attention to what's going on tomorrow or the next day or the next day. Like well, we, we very rarely chill. pay attention to what's going on now. And like sometimes when you do that, your life moves in fast forward yeah. because you're always chasing there and you never actually get there because then the next thing comes along. Um, and I'm terrible for doing that. You know, oh, my husband says to me, oh, my God, you will organize the fun out of anything, won't you? And I'm like, I do. Like, I literally do. It's terrible. But I think it's because in order to keep plates spinning, you have to be organized and you have to chase and you have to do that. But I'm sort of really consciously trying to stop doing that and like you just said, that noticing those small things and paying attention to small things and carving out time and space for me by doing certain things. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm starting to get a handle on that again. And it sounds so simple, but it really does make a massive, massive difference. 
Mm. Well, the next line, which is actually weirdly on the next page, but it completely relates directly. The capacity for delight is the gift of paying attention. And again, you know, none of us are doing that. We're just sort of, you know, unless we we actually think about it and go, right, today I'm going to set intentions and this is how the day is going to go. Or yeah. I'm going to really revel in the, the beauty when I go on a walk rather than being on my phone or whatever. And I think it's a really good thing that people hear you say it's someone that is top of their game, that the top is always replaceable because you'll look for the next top. Oh my God, always. And you won't stop and go, oh, look at the lovely details of the bit that I'm at now. You're Mm -hmm. going to the next bit. And and that is perhaps because, you know, you haven't found that inner peace. You're looking for something elsewhere. Chasing for something. To harness a feeling of I'm okay. Maybe it's safety. I don't know. Well, the other thing is it's complete and utter distraction. And, you know, I talk about this in the book as, as well as a way, it's a way of detaching actually. And detachment is a big thing that I've had to sort of discover about myself and learn the reasons why I do it. And to a certain extent, sometimes I think it can be very helpful and sometimes it can be very damaging, but there is definitely safety in ignoring how you're feeling right now. <laughs> so yeah. we distract ourselves with these to, with these to-do lists and these things we've got to do because it's far safer. Like if you can race and chase and pat, be patted on the back of it as a person that can multitask, hey, amazing. Other people think I'm brilliant and I don't even have to look in and see what's really going on. So, you know, it's it, it works both ways. But the, to a point you said earlier as well, um, we have to, I have to be really careful because even in doing like trying to focus and trying to stay in the now because I'm the type of person that kind of goes, oh, I have to be really good at this. I have to be really good at this. I start to overthink even this safe space, the safe feeling, this right, right. And now I'm just going to focus on making myself a cup of tea in the morning. But I have to be really careful that I don't start overanalyzing even that because I've just got a tendency to do that. That's what I do. So it comes out in all areas of my life and I just have to, just have to be aware of it and sort of just to be a bit more, I just have to let those things go a bit and be a bit more nonchalant. Like that's what I need to be in life. Mm, it's tricky though, because I think when you're used to working in that way and you're used to excellence and achievement, it, it's hard to break that loop and to give yourself a break. It's giving mm. yourself a break of going, it doesn't matter if I'm a bit sloppy today. It doesn't matter if this isn't the best, best, best it can yeah. be. And you know, that, that also, you know, we, that's played into on a societal level because we're so used to now seeing so-called perfection or yeah, aren't we? excellence or whatever it is that it's been normalized. And it wasn't like that 50 years ago, but now all of a sudden, no. you know, we've normalized perfection and none of us really know what to do about it because we're all going, oh my God, I'm meant to be perfect. I don't feel it. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I'm talking for myself here. I certainly don't feel perfect ever. Yeah. I just sort of stumble through things the best I can. But I think that's the danger that on a societal level, it's become so normalized that we view perfection. Mm. No, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. And often things that are perfect can be completely and utterly dull. Like if somebody stands up and does a perfect kind of reading or a speech, you're like, hmm. I wish they'd messed up a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's much I mean, more I, fun. I, I, I All the things do. that come out of that, the mistakes. Yeah. The mistakes are always the most interesting thing. No, we I know think. that from this morning. Like they're the bits no. that go every, you know, people want to see that the stuff. Lord. But, but, you know, I, I look to people like, I don't know, David Bowie back in the day who, you know, he had crooked teeth and, you know, missed much colored eyes. And he was yeah. just in his flow creating. Perfect wasn't on his radar. It was just... No his channel and we've we've gone into a weird era of that but look I want to just reverse a little bit and talk about this you know you do a whole chapter on detachment so obviously this has been a big thing for you and I didn't know this I didn't know that you had this period of life where you felt a disconnect a detachment from your everyday and I I want what did that feel like you know were you did you feel numb is that the the Mm. feeling of detachment it's funny because I'm sort of talking about it looking back because I think the, the best way I can describe it is, you know, like when you drive, when you're driving a car or you're trying to get to somewhere and you suddenly get there and you go, oh my God, my brain was just thinking about so many different things. I mean, I got here and I was obviously safe because I know the route, but I completely switched off, but my body knew what to do. And I think to a certain extent, I'd been doing that in other areas of my life. And no, it wasn't like some big, terrible, oh my God, I've missed out on so much. It wasn't, it wasn't as extreme as that. But what it did do, I think, was took the edge off things 
for better and for worse. So you kind of function in this safe middle ground. Um, and I'd even find myself um, never really getting like particularly angry about stuff or particularly upset about things. Like it just, things just kind of, you know, it is almost like a numbing thing. Like you just sort of didn't let too much in bother you or not bother you. And you just kind of exist. And, and I wonder whether that's just quite a safe place because if you stay in that sort of middle lane and you're not getting too bothered about stuff and you're not getting too whatever about stuff, no one's getting too offended by what you're saying. So it's all quite safe. It's Does safe. that stop you leaning into the joy as well, though, as well as the anger and the sorrow? Uh, probably. I mean, probably. I didn't, I again, like, this isn't as extreme as I'm probably making it sound, but it was just, I just notice having, starting to reconnect with stuff, I go, oh my God. And I'm more so the feeling the anger than feeling the joy. I think joy yeah. is easier to access because it feels good. But I think you shy away from the bad stuff that's where I was detaching more. I think the other end of the spectrum, a little bit maybe, but not massively. But the 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 that other end, the kind of ugly end, the end that you don't want to look at, that was the end that I was like not having any of that. Don't look over there. Don't want to look over there. Look, just it's just all be yeah. nice. Let's just keep it all there. Anyway, and obviously that's ridiculous because you can't do that. But what's lovely is I've begun to I've begun to really enjoy anger. Like anger, I love anger. Great. It's like so anger's good. a really good and powerful emotion and I think from going from something that I was so terrified about I was like hold on a second anger can be really useful like I suddenly discovered how I really felt about everything because there would be this hot flash of like anger and I'd be like yeah. oh wow I really do hate that that's amazing or like things where I became oh, what's really the problem with this what's at the root of the problem and suddenly in two seconds you'd be shouting and saying something you'd be like oh my god there it is there it is Oh, there we yeah. go. I don't need to go and, you know, meditate on that for a month. I don't need to go and see a therapist. It was like, it was there and all it's going. And I was like, there you are. Oh yeah. You, you want to see me run me. around the park when I'm angry. I am Usain Bolt. Like I am channeling that rage. I, yeah. I think if you harness anger, yeah. it can be really Pull you forward. Amazing. Yeah. And you know what? I, anger I've never struggled with. Like anger is always a little bit under the surface for me. It doesn't take me much to access that. And I don't know I why that's just, I have the propensity to go there and I'm, I can be quite fiery, but there are certainly other things that I've, I've probably suppressed sorrow more than anything about certain situations in my life, time periods of my life where I haven't yeah. really either mourned the loss of something or a part of me. I haven't allowed myself to, I've seen it as self-indulgent or, ridiculous yeah. and I I'm getting back in touch with that which feels really good as well but I wonder with that suppressed anger you know it's in there you you can't as you said you can't contain it mm. it's, it's not it, there's no possibility that, that you could contain any emotion we have to have I was a, really a, good a at fluidity. it though. yeah so yeah exactly like <laughs> I don't know how but it's in there but how you know, did that manifest in other ways was there something else that helped with the sort of I mean, you just thought you so I know you'd have thought so, wouldn't you? Like you think, yeah. God, it's got to come out somewhere. But I think I was really good at it. Like, I think my self-defense and self-protection mechanism was incredible. Like, I actually think that was probably my greatest skill, but to my detriment in some way. Um, but it's okay because actually it didn't come out in a way that has caused any damage, particularly. I think it's interesting to look at now and unpack it. Like I'm really, it's got, it's really telling. Um, and I'm glad I've done it now. I'm really glad I've done it now. Um, but also like, I'm not, um, I don't blame. I, I like, I know, I know why it had to happen. And I'm kind of, it's like that old magic that your body and brain does that we're not in control of. Like it's a coping mechanism. It, it did a really good thing. It did yeah. a really good thing. So I don't want to sit here and go, oh my God, it was awful because it wasn't actually. And I think these things happen to get you through something. But once you come out the other side, I think then it's what you do next with it. And what I'm doing next with it is leaning into it and going, okay. But I'm proud, like, I'm, I'm very proud of my head and my body for knowing what to do. It's like when you're, when you get pregnant or you're, go into labor, like your body just takes over. And sometimes I think we need to, for a little control freak like me, 
when you're when you're reminded of that sometimes that there is something something going on innately that's bigger than your sort of conscious decision making head it's a nice reminder just to let go and just go with it yeah and also to I think be kinder to ourselves because I can certainly notice patterns uh, of a similar nature in my own past where you know I've shut down certain parts of me or um, I've had to stop doing something and I again I've got the propensity to really beat myself up about it like why can't you cope why are you doing this but actually it is a coping mechanism and yeah. in times where you're going through shit you do whatever you've got to do to to survive yeah. it and get through it and you know things will happen like you said without thought uh, they are they are mechanisms and you know we can we can replace them we can remove them but you know we don't have to beat ourselves up for not yeah. when you're going through it yeah like I think when you're going through something you just got to do whatever feels right yeah but it doesn't mean that you have to stay with that forever or that that has to become some overriding mm. power or the focus of everything or all of those things like I think that that that's where you can make changes I think yeah so you had this sort of seminal moment where you were in Australia doing get me out of here and you had a bit more time and space because you were you weren't in the home and you decided to go and see a, a kinesiologist and you you write about in this this in the book yeah how, how did that help and um at what pace you know at what point did you think oh something's shifting here I mean the, yes this was kind of the the start of it really I mean I've always I've always had an interest in alternative things anyway even when I was younger a very good friend of mine is a Reiki master and she attuned me to Reiki like when I was like 17 so like I've had that kind of draw to things like this and again as life takes over it's something you should shut down and ignore you know that you kind of go oh I haven't got time to think about that sort of thing but it's it's been nice to revisit it but yes Australia was it was a, a kind of a little gift really because a I wasn't meant to be there B, I was on the other side of the world. I was without my children and without my husband for two weeks, I think, before they came out. And I had this apartment <laughs> and I had nothing to do apart from look after myself. And I was in the land of the alternative life. And I was like, right, I'm going to do everything. I'm just going to dive on in here and see what feels good. And I had some weird experiences and I met some wonderful people. But yeah, there was this lady in particular who was, you know, a kinesiologist, but she was more than that I mean there was seriously something else going on there because she was she definitely unlocked something and I know that people are very wary of people maybe going in and having an unlocking moment in say something that's not necessarily the NHS wouldn't recommend you know there is there is a professional route to go down with your psychologist and your therapy and that oh there is an alternative route now for me they worked beautifully alongside each other um, but uh, there was this moment and it was, yeah, it was actually, it was bloody terrifying. If I'm going to be completely honest, it was, it wasn't a nice feeling. Like it wasn't like a Eureka Alleluia moment. It wasn't nice, but I knew that it was the beginning of something. And so, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that was, that was it really. That was kind of the, the beginning and, and what started off as scary. I now love and, I I don't want it. I, I don't think I'm never going to be at that point where you go, oh yeah, that's all over. I did that. Now I'm fixed. It's like, even if somebody could go, oh, I'll wave a magic wand and fix you. I'd be like, no way. Like I'm enjoying this. Like, I don't want to be done. I'm quite, I just want to keep digging down and finding more because it's like, it's really nice to get to know yourself. Mm. Like I feel like I'm meeting myself, like my adult self. Mm, it's so it's so true and it's endless it goes on forever that's why I'm more excited about life now than ever because I can see that it's never ending I'm never going to reach you know that that sort of amazing moment the pinnacle of life where I am I am complete like it's not I know it's not going to happen and I'm mm. excited to go on the undulating journey not a fan of that word either but not sure what else to say there is no um, other word to replace exploration, journey really annoying. exploration let's go with that um i i'm excited about that so look, let's talk about this you meeting you i'm deeply fascinated about this because it's it's definitely something i've experienced myself and you know in very, a very different way to you you know i i've talked about this a, a whole load on this podcast yeah. and in other spaces but i had a moment where 
my life was sort of cracked in two, not in a great way. There was no good bit about it and it was bloody horrible. Mm -hmm. But it sort of shattered an illusion for me completely. And lots of stuff that I used to believe in didn't make sense anymore. And uh, the way that I thought of myself didn't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. So I certainly had to meet the real me at all stages of my life, the bits of me I didn't like and still don't particularly like, but I'm working with. And it's a really cool, difficult challenge. And again, you know, one that is, is endless. And, you know, mm. we're, we're the same age. It perhaps is also something to do with age and, and growth. Um, this is the good thing about getting older, by yeah, the way, all you people, young ones listening to this. This is like the joy of getting older is that yeah, you go, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not, I'm not scared to look in. And I think for me, Fern, when it came to, right, sort of trying to work out exactly who this person is, who, who am I? Sounds crazy, but it's true. No, no. It was like, I had to challenge the set of beliefs I was living by. Mm. I was like, right, okay, I'm feeling mega guilty now. Why? What's making me feel guilty? Is it that I'm working too much? Is it that I'm like the whole working mum guilt thing, for example? And you go, oh my God, I'm a working mum. I can't do, I can't drop my kids off at school in the morning because I'm always at work. And I and I had this thing that I just thought, oh my God, people are going to think that. And actually what I pulled it down to was thinking people must think that I don't love my kids because I go to work. And I was thinking that if I actually break that down to what I'm telling myself, that's mad because of course I love my kids. I love my kids with every ounce of my being. Like, so why am I telling, why am I feeling, why am I feeling guilty? Because I know I, I know I'm going to work because I enjoy going to work and it's got no co correlation to how much I love my kids. So two things shouldn't even be said in the same sentence, but I'm believing a set of beliefs that I think other people are feeling. So that was the, that was like yeah. a, right, forget that. Like, that's what an ancestral that's, hangover. That's, that's, that's mad. Yeah. That's like complete madness. So it's kind of like snipping at strings of balloons filled with beliefs that don't belong to me. Mm. They're somebody else's. So, you know, that was just an example of one thing, but there were many, many of those moments where I was like, whose beliefs are these? Are they mine? And, and it's hard to work at. That's the thing. It's hard to hear that voice. It's hard to find that voice because you go, are they mine? And you go, I don't know, are they? Are they? And quite often you end up sort of, you got, sometimes you can't, you don't even know what are your beliefs and what are the beliefs of yeah. somebody. Like, I listen to a podcast with someone, you go, yeah, they're right, they're right. You know, God, God, did you hear that personal happy place? That's exactly how I feel. And then you listen to them and goes, oh no, now I feel like that. And sometimes there are two, like listening to information and educating yourself and growing by, you know, by having all this input is wonderful, but you have to reserve a little piece of you for you. We have to have we have to have our intuition intact. Otherwise, yeah. we're going to be untethered to the max. We're going to be literally pinging because we are bombarded with information all day, and we can access any information at any time we want all day in a very in varying mediums. Yeah. And if we don't get that intuition, we're fucked because we will just literally imbibe everything, and then you're left with a mixing pot, as you say, of everything. And let's also not underestimate fame because you know being in the public eye is it looks glamorous and amazing and whatever, but it's deeply confusing because you have exterior noise all day, every day from complete strangers. And I actually found recently, I was watching, I don't know if you've seen it, Ruby Wax's brilliant show. Did oh you my see God. it? I'm obsessed with it. Oh, it's I, so well, good. I her. I'm completely yeah. obsessed with her. And her looking back at yeah. that, those times, not only sort of dissecting the guests, but also dissecting how she went into those situations and dissecting her own ascent, because she was, you know, certainly for us growing up in the 90s, she was everything. She was this mm. amazing, vivacious character who mm. was just going and doing what she wanted. But she was so honest in saying, when you're at that level of fame, you have to almost create a character to cope with it. And yeah. then there's a moment where you get lost and you don't know the difference between the character and the you bit. And I wonder if if that's playing into this somewhat. You know, it's funny. I, I, I saw her say that and I thought uh, that's interesting. But it's weird for me because in the same way that kind of people will say the silence is deafening. For me, that kind of deafening noise of fame is silence. Right. Because it almost cancels itself out for me because there's so much of it 
I can't, I almost can't hear it because it's like, it's too, it's like a wall. A great coping mechanism again, a great natural coping mechanism. Basically I've detached from it, Fern. So I haven't come. (laughs) Let it go. But I'm okay with detaching from that. That's fine. Like, that's why, that's what I mean. Like the detachment can be great. In the right and moment. I don't know whether in five years I'll go, oh, I really need to engage with that bit because actually that plays quite a big bit in my life. But I don't know. I don't know yet because I'm just stepping through life, taking on one challenge at a time. But for me, keeping it silent works. Like wow. I will turn the volume up on you, my friends, my family, like that I want to hear, that I want to take in, but not that. I can't. I can't. How can, yeah. you, how can, you, how can you deal with that amount of stuff? Well, I, I don't, <laughs> I can't, like I literally can't do all the stuff I used to do. And some of it is to do with that. Some of it is because I'm still dealing with a lot of healing with panic attacks and, and that's still yeah. stuff that I live with. So I can't, so I'm, I'm, I guess from afar, I am fascinated at these coping mechanisms because I cannot cope with it so much so that I've had to remove myself from it. You know, And this is my little, I mean, yeah. my little shed, I've got my little headphones on. I'm talking to people that I want to talk to. I feel super safe here and I feel safe doing my radio show because it's my little space again and writing my books because I'm just being a little nerd on my laptop. But for me to step into that again, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but right Mm -hmm. now there's no way, there's no way I could set foot in that space. And for my body, this overrides intellect for my body, to feel safe my body goes into absolute shock and I so I don't want to I'm not even going to push myself right now don't do, well, but why would I'm you and... not to, yeah because you know what part of me thinks yeah, I can do that I have a right to try and do it but then the other part goes this just walk down this path for a bit and see what happens but I'm deeply intrigued at the coping mechanisms because you have this every day you're on tv every day you walk down the street people are shouting your name blah blah I'm deeply intrigued at the coping mechanisms in place because whatever they are, they're working. They're really working. And it's, I'm sure it's a plethora of things, a support network, et cetera. Yeah. But it's really cool that you've found those tools. To, like, to be honest, to I've it. never, I've never massively engaged with it, I think, as well. Even, even from the get-go. Um, I don't, I think like I come home and I shut the door and it's gone. Like I don't rethink about it. I don't think about it. I don't sit in it it doesn't worry me it doesn't bother me I I'm very grateful and I love what I do but and I know that this is probably very difficult for a lot of people to understand because people go she's absolutely lying but I really really mean this wholeheartedly and I don't want this to happen but if it did happen if it all switched off tomorrow I'd be okay because my 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 real life and my real love and my real passion is when that door shuts and that won't ever change because that's mine. So all the other stuff that goes on, it's like the cherry on the top. And I don't want it to go because I love it. Like, don't get me wrong. It's, I'm very, very lucky and very fortunate. But I think, I think what, if, 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 you know, if something was to happen to Dan or the kids or my family environment or my friends, the bottom would fall out of my world and I couldn't cope. Like I could not cope. That would be... That would be me gone. The rest of the stuff, it's important, but it's not important to me and me and my being, if you like. Yeah, and I guess that will strengthen even more so the more you, without sounding cheesy, meet with yourself. Because the deeper the relationship you have with yourself, the the quieter and quieter that stuff gets. And I'm looking forward to that because, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I still do find outside noise distracting and the thing that I don't like is if I'm misunderstood by people because I really Mm. know what my intentions are and I really know what my mission is in life and I don't like being misunderstood then why are you worried like not like like take my example I don't know like if somebody's saying if if you know that if you know that why are you listening to what they're saying like Like, why is that getting in bear the thought I mean maybe some of it is sort of a trauma-y type hangover but I can't deal with people having the wrong idea about me it's something that I I do a lot of work on and I find it deeply and again you know like I was watching from afar when you've got the every person in the press saying that you and Philip are having a tough time and meanwhile you're great friends yeah and there was no arguments and I thought I wouldn't I wouldn't cope with that 
there's no way I would be going hello we're best friends leave me alone like I wouldn't cope I would I don't have the inner strength to yeah. shut shop and go oh yeah think what you like I'm not there yet I'm not there yet well uh, it's a funny one isn't it I mean it is don't get me wrong like it is difficult and I mean that was a particularly difficult time of course for many reasons but um I think, and I, I remember having this conversation with Phil at the time and it was like, but we know, like we know, like I have to believe that, that as long as you know inside and it, you know your, you know the truth, you know your truth, then everything's got to be okay. It has to be. And I have to hold on to that. Like I can't start questioning that. And I have to hold on to that. Yeah. No, I get it. I, otherwise it would be, You'd ha you couldn't confront that every day if you didn't have that no. coping mechanism in place. God, I'd be exhausted. It, it, yeah, absolutely exhausting. So let, let's talk about inner and outer beauty because that that is the theme of the book and a lot of the other work that you're doing. And yeah. you say that um, you can't have outer beauty without inner beauty. And I think this is so interesting because that seemingly is the problem that we're dealing with on a big level at the moment, probably... Yeah near exclusively with social media I know it yeah. also lies in other parts but on social media there is so much acute focus on outside beauty and almost none on inner beauty I, I know it's harder to perhaps sort of depict or illustrate inner beauty on social media or mm. in that way but still our focus is still just pinpoint outer beauty outer beauty and we could mm. be throwing all of our likes and follows at people that aesthetically look incredible but they could be a right old cow we don't know what's going on yeah. in their world or yeah. what their inner beauty is like and I wonder you know what do we do we need to pull focus on that surely and, and try and marry the two together um, that well that's I mean that's my entire point really and I feel like you know the first half of the book obviously a lot of these things we've been talking about is what is what comes up. And I think that's kind of laying your foundations, really, getting your foundation for self-right. And then actually, when it comes to outer beauty, certain things that you thought were important before are less important now. Because I think, because like you say, on social media, there seems to be a one-stop shop of beauty, a certain way of looking, which everything feeds into, everybody buys into. It's kind of dominated by youth, I guess, which yes, is beautiful in its innocence and it is a wonderful thing to be celebrated, but it's not the only, it's not my, it's not my only version of beauty. For me, there are many, many different things of being beautiful. And I think the key is, is that in order for that to stop, we have to celebrate difference and we have to celebrate all the individuality and different quirks of anyone around and there's only one way to do that and that is to fully and totally accept those within ourselves because if you can't love your wonky teeth if you can't love your nose that may not be a perfect kind of little tiny button nose that someone's had surgically reduced here, here. I've got one of those character guys that's what I've got <laughs> exactly if you can't embrace your individuality and those bits of you then how can you embrace that in other people? All you're going to do is feed into this monstrous kind of creation of this paper doll society of everybody coming out looking the same way. Yeah, but it's hard, isn't it? Like, you know, I because I think it goes even beyond that. You know, I, I've, I've made peace with my dad's nose that I have on You've my face. You've got a beautiful I, nose. I like it. I'm into it. I'm into it. I like it. But there are bits of me that I really struggle with. And they're not, they're nothing to do with my body. You know, there are some bits where you look in the mirror and go, oh, for fuck's sake, you know, I've literally got, my stomach is made of tissue paper. I'll tick all the cliches there. But mine is so much deeper. Mine is going into past regrets and things I've said that I shouldn't have and actions I've done that I know haven't come from a benevolent place back in the day or whatever. We've all got these. I find that level of acceptance so hard. Like I, that is the stuff that I do a lot of therapy on yeah. is making peace with those things that have happened or past versions of me integrating the two, et cetera. I think that's really hard. Like where are you with that? Well, I think, God, maybe I'm just a bit more brutal with things like that. But I think that all of those things that you've just said about yourself there, like when each of those things happened, I imagine you learned something from those, didn't you? Like you must have yeah, come away in and the gone, moment where I'm embracing myself, that goes out the window. But but you must you all of those 
like whatever you, if you describe it as a mistake or things that happen, you learn from that. And if you learn from that, you've grown from that. So you don't need to integrate. I don't feel like you need to integrate anything. You just have to know that like no one's going to get through this life unscathed. No one is. Um, But there's no point dragging stuff like that behind you because you're going to limit where you're going. Well, I think we do it on such a subconscious level. Like we had Mel Robbins on the podcast. I don't know if it will have been out by the time this goes out or not, but we were talking about this. And when you look at yourself in the mirror and not in a way where you're like putting makeup on or whatever, but you look at yourself and you're like, that's me. Yeah. And I'm and and in those moments, you will recognize that you are subconsciously carrying 40 years of shit around with you or whatever. Yeah. And I definitely do that. I do that in, you know, and and I again, I'm I'm very quick to judge myself and very quick to criticize myself. Um, This is all stuff that I work on, but I'll I'll bring all of it in. in, If I'm having a thing, you need to I think you need to, you know, something from 20 years ago. I'm bringing that in today. I'll do it all the time, all the time. Can you not rewrite the narrative slightly? And I, I mean, I'm not like flippantly trying to like brush this away, but like, because I've like, trust me, I've done this. And for me, a lot of this, you know, you know, as you, it's particularly as you're getting older. And I think when you hit your forties, things change quite rapidly, actually, you know, we're sort of heading towards that kind of menopausal time. Yay. Skin is changing, hair is changing, you know, body's changing. Yeah. Even having had a baby, you know, your, your shape of your body completely changes. And I think that it's really important in those moments to kind of rather than look down and go, oh, my God, you know, look, uh, everything's changing. I'm getting older. I'm getting more wrinkled. Oh, my God, my tits around my knees. You know, instead of looking down, kind of you sort of got to look up with it and go, God, you know, my body was able to carry a baby and my boobs breastfed to three children and they were fine. Well, two and a half, just that was useless. I was useless, couldn't quite do it. Um, and then and then you've got to go, like, you know, I'm yes, I, you know, I'm my face is starting to sag and my eyes are bloodshot and the rest of it, but like I'm healthy and I'm okay. And getting older is like a privilege because not everybody else gets to be here. And I don't know, I don't I mean, you must have it with honey, like having a daughter, I'm very aware of like the example I set now in this stage because she's definitely, you know, Belle's 10. So she is old enough now to be watching me. And I want to conduct myself in a way that when she gets to this stage, it's like, it's like I'm clearing the pathway for her. That's how I feel about about many things, not just about outward image, but, but, you know, this is what we're talking about now. But yeah, I feel like, I feel I have a responsibility there to do this in a way that is a positive experience for all of us. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely trying. I just think, Maybe some people um, lean more into, I don't know if it's even optimism and pessimism, but um, being able to move through life without bringing the past in more so. I don't know. And it's, you know, I think we've all got strengths and weaknesses and I know mine certainly are there and sometimes shouting quite loudly and often they are linked to the past. And I think I probably wouldn't have panic attacks if I didn't do it. They probably wouldn't have any potency because I would just go no you don't need to do but you this, can't but escape your past like I'm that not is not that's not what I'm saying like you can't it's yeah. not like I'm detaching and running away like you cannot do that like you have to you have to make peace with it you do you do and yeah. that's not easy and that's nope. not easy and there are many different levels of what people go through different things and it's not easy and it never I don't think you ever make full peace with it but you can turn the volume down I think yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I mean, actually, I think more often than not now, if something does come up, I'll just end up talking about it on here or writing about it. So I'll get it out. I think you just need That's to get so it good. out of you. Yeah, you've got to get it out and get it moving and whatever. So let's talk about, you mentioned this a while back in the conversation, but I it was an interesting chapter again on control. Yeah. And I think having talked about a lot of um, coping mechanisms today. I think often control is used in the same way because if I'm not feeling safe in a certain situation, and it's not like a scary situation, it will be something that's very mundane for other people, but it, it, yeah. it somewhat triggers me. I will go into absolute pernickety control freak mode. And if there's, and it could be on a, a very um, 
again, aesthetic level. It could be on quite a visceral level, like an inner, an itch of feeling. I'm, I'm mm. trying to get control over all of that shit. And I'm, I'm reaching for safety. Do you think that lies beneath your drive to, to have control in life? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think when you feel like you're doing something, you feel like you're in control of it somehow. Like I'm a really bad flyer because I swear to God, it's because I'm not flying that plane. Yeah. I heard it's Dawn like, French I'm... once say when she's in a plane, she has to think it stays in. She's she's using her brain to make it stay in the air. Like she's literally I get that. it afloat. Like you're going to stay in the air. Genuinely, I get that. I get that. Yeah, I totally yeah. get that. Like I'm not very good at relinquishing any control anywhere. However, what I'm really trying to do is just to focus on me. And like, I just need to make my world smaller because if you try and control absolutely everything that's going on around you, it's an impossibility. Got like that go. is not happening. You can't, you can't do it. What you can do is you can just focus on, on yourself and you can just focus on this and what this feels like. And like, if I'm feeling out of control or if things are getting too much or I feel like that thing is just, I can feel it bubbling. Like I literally, it's just a case of shutting my eyes and just going in and going, right, what's going on in there? I'm just going to take a few deep breaths and I'm just going to feel how I'm feeling. And I'm just going to consciously try and take my heart rate down a bit. And I'm just going to, calm down because the moment I start trying to micromanage every single person in this room this is going to go stratospheric off the charts out of control and no one wins so it's bringing it back everything like this is I think this is the thing with, that I really want to stress in this book it's like bringing it back just bringing it back to you and focusing on yourself and knowing that you know that you have this power within you that was there all along and you just need to focus on it and harness it and it is there and it does and it does help and it does work well we're all out of control aren't we none of us have any control over anything the only thing we potentially can control is our reaction to the stuff that's happening around yeah. us that's the only thing we can make a you know a, yeah. a choice about is i'm going to react in this way yeah. or i'm going to react in that way the rest of it we have to, we have to let go. Letting go is so hard. Mm -hmm. It is well, so it is when you're hard. a control freak like me. Yeah, and it sounds like you are too. So oh, I think hugely. Like I, I, I know I am because, but it's in certain pockets where I really don't feel safe. Yeah, and at other times I can let go because I feel pretty held and like it's okay, and that's mm. then quite exciting, and maybe that is then when you can lean into whatever happens in that moment but mm. when there's a lack of safety and for me again that is in that for me is like okay one example a very mundane thing for a lot of people sleep yeah. I don't necessarily feel a safety in that portion of my life will I just naturally fall asleep will I have to wake mm. up in the night will it will this ruin the next day there's so many variables oh, that I could easily be you know thrown you know what? I'm cool with all of this. I've I'm 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 learning loads. I'm exploring. Mm. It's all part of the fun. I'm not going to give myself a hard time about it. But but that's where I get very controlling, and I have to have yeah. my own exact pillow that is the same pillow. I have to have the exact eye mask. I have to have one earplug. It like it's crazy. It yeah. sounds crazy, but if I'm controlling that situation, at least I think I know this has worked before. Yeah. And You're again, doing it's a coping, something it's a coping about mechanism, it. isn't it? Yeah. It's a coping mechanism. And I think, you know, the thing that I'm, I'm getting the most from this conversation is we've got to just find our own coping mechanisms and whatever they are, there's no right or wrong. There's no like textbook coping mechanism here. You, know, you might be able to read about them in books and take heed of them, but actually they're probably intuitive and um, they'll be happening without you even realizing it anyway. And whatever coping mechanisms we have annoyingly get flush down the toilet whenever there is fear around and fear is a bastard so we need to try and worst. we just need to like be aware of that and go right we're not going to get away from fear there's going to be moments where we fear, fear fearful but it's in those moments we have to dig really really deep and really really go right now I need my coping mechanisms more than anything because this is going to make me react and fall into all those pitfalls that I've been falling in all this time but I just need to really hold on to these things that I know work for me 
and use them even more. Or if you're feeling in the right frame of mind, look beneath the fear. If you're, you know, you've got to be in the right frame of mind to take a deep look at it. But if you look at what that is, so say I use my sleep example again, right? Why the hell am I so scared about, or why do I feel so unsafe is the right terminology um, in that environment. And if I keep digging and digging, I mean, if I kept digging, it would probably be a self-worth related thing. I'm going to be a pile of shit tomorrow at work and then I'll fall even further into insecurity or whatever. There'll be some deep yeah. la layer for everything. So I think, you know, we can rely on our coping mechanisms, but also it's super interesting if you feel in the right headspace to go, I wonder what's underneath that because it's mm. never really the thing that we think we're scared of yeah it's something on a subterranean level down here yeah that you haven't explored and that again if you're in the right frame of mind can be quite cool yeah shine a light into those cracks yeah you what, find. what what do you think what's beneath your fear do you know what it is i do i do i know i know what it is but it's um it's well, it's not something that is easy to talk about and it's not something that I'm there yet with either. So I think that, I also think sometimes, I think sometimes for me, things like that can be distracting for others and people will focus on that rather than the actual message and point of what I want to talk about, which is, you know, how, how you can move past it and yeah. how there is a way. So so yeah, I think pinpointing those things is key, a hundred percent. I think you have to, in order to be able to let the healing begin. Yeah, no, I get it. I mean, I'm I'm very um, boundaryed. Although talk about a lot of this stuff, I too have big things that I haven't made peace with that I won't talk about. And yeah. I think that's it's very um, it's very healthy to have these boundaries because. Yeah unless you are completely at peace with situations or feelings, it's, it's not good. This, and this is the important message because again and again, we hear, you know, and even part of the point of this podcast is that telling stories and listening is super important and amazing and can be really liberating, but only when you feel in the right space to oh, do yeah. so and in the right frame of mind and you know these conversations don't have to be big and public we are because this is hopefully helpful for other people but yeah. for people listening if there are things that you want to talk about but you feel you know deep pain with I certainly have that you you need to pick the right person or the right professional or whoever it might yeah. be it doesn't have to be a huge discussion with you know, a group of people or whatever, it's got to be right for you and, and on your terms. And I think that's a really important point to make whenever we're talking about stuff like this and, and getting beneath the sort of reactions and the emotions of, mm -hmm. of what are playing out. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Well, um, how fascinating. I mean, oh, we've, fun. We've, dissected, we did we've, it. <laughs> we've dissected so many oh bits God. and things I didn't know about you and... Um, mm. And, and it's it's very cool that you're going on this explorative journey. Journey. Um, and it's exciting to Aww. sort of see where that goes and, and what happens me. next. Absolute pleasure. Absolute oh, it's been pleasure. lovely. Thank you, Holly. Lots of love. Love to everybody Thanks. as well.